Thank you for downloading this Council on Foreign Relations video. CFR is an independent national membership organization and nonpartisan research center. For more information, please visit us online at CFR.org. Hi, uh, my name is Ken Oletter, and I'm going to be moderating this discussion. Um, probably the only people less, uh, more popular than members of Congress. <laughs> Um, are the five of us up here because we're members of the press. Um, we're here today to talk about uh, foreign policy um, and meeting industry challenges, which is really I'm going to focus much more on talking about how the networks, the four networks represented here, uh, treat foreign policy and what some of the future challenges are in the television world. I'm not going to give you a long introduction, just by name. Uh, David Weston, the president of ABC News. John McManus, the president of CBS News, Steve Kappas, the president of NBC News, and Jonathan Klein, the president of CNN USA. Um, a word about format. We're going to have a conversation here for 30 or 40 minutes. Uh, then we're going to go out to the audience um, uh, for questions for members. Uh, this is on the website of the council. Uh, it's on the record. And please, if you would, turn off your cell phones uh, or any electronic device. Um, at Walter Cronkite's service yesterday, uh, former President Clinton um, made a statement. He said, I once went sailing with Walter Cronkite, and he said to me, I learned, one of the things I learned in television news business is that you can't just be a well-educated citizen by watching television news. You have to read newspapers. Do you agree with that? Sure. <laughs> Sure, <laughs> absolutely. And, and more than just newspapers. Yeah. I yeah. mean, there's so much more that can keep you up to speed and well-educated. I don't think television news ever set out to be the only source of people's information. I mean, what if it were? Well, well I, <laughs> I mean, I think there would happen, television news would have to change if it played that role and, uh, necessarily, and people would have a different uh, set of information and more limited. And there's not enough hours in the day to learn what you can learn from newspapers and magazines to watch that much television to figure out what's going on in the world. I think, um, I think you know, one of the things we're facing is a lot of our kids probably will never read newspapers, which does not mean they'll be less informed. They'll get their information from different sources. But I think reading and getting the perspective you get from some kind of print source is absolutely vital. And I think as good a job as we do in producing news coverage, we can't duplicate what the written word can often do, often uh, often give you. Thanks very John, much, John. But you got 24 hours on CNN. Do you have a slightly different answer? No, because uh, people don't sit and watch for 24 hours straight. So you're still getting people for brief moments in time and hoping to keep them longer and pull them through. The interesting thing <coughs> is that the, the 24 hours does give you time to challenge some of the preconceived notions about what works and what doesn't in television news. It's one thing to be putting on a 22-minute broadcast. That does require a, a different way of thinking than say, you know what, um, can, we, can we attract viewers with Fareed Zakaria interviewing global thought leaders for an hour every Sunday? The answer turns out to be yes, right? He usually wins his time period that way. That's <coughs> not something that these guys could or would do on their networks, it's just a different business, really. Steve, let me start uh, the, the, with you with the next question, which is that if you go back to 9-11, after 9-11, the American people said, how come we didn't know more about Islam and, and Al-Qaeda? And then there was a tremendous growth of international news coverage in all media. Um, and then it, it seems to have slipped. And let me cite, uh, the previous panel talked about statistics on international news coverage. And actually, the Pew Center Project for Excellence in Journalism has come up with some. And they said that in 2007, NBC News, the nightly newscast, 19.8% of their coverage that year was international news. This year, so far, it's down to 13%. They said that CBS was 10.4% in 2007. This year, so far, 13.7%. ABC News was 19.6%, they said, and now it's down to 129 CNN was 26.2%, and 
and now it's down to 14.8%. So <clears throat> why? I think you can look at statistics and you can come up with it any number of different ways. I, you know, I, I tend to look at the quality of the journalism and I think there is some great work being done by all of the organizations right now that in my, what I would hope to see is that we celebrate some of the fine work that's being done. There's people who are putting their lives at risk covering international news these days and doing a great job. Um, you know, we haven't had a panel like this before in the time that I've had this job. But we talk to, we tend to talk to each other when something awful has happened to somebody who works for us. Uh, and that has primarily been in places like Afghanistan and Iraq. But, you know, I, I think there's some great work being done there by the numbers d is not necessarily the way I view it. I, you know, I, I, I look at reporting mm -hmm. that comes out of Washington that may not get classified as international. Um, and I think you also have to consider that, uh, as John was saying, you've got, if you're doing a nightly newscast, you've got to look at what's happened in the world. You've got a precious amount of time, small amount of time, that you're trying to put an awful lot of, of information and context to the events that have happened in a single day. And whether that's happening domestically or internationally, it's a tall order to try to figure out how to get it all in. And probably Iraq has something to do with that. Probably there's falling less off the radar. Uh, yeah. But if you go back through history, this has always been the case. I mean, if you go back to the 1920s, there wasn't nearly as much foreign coverage of the New York Times. And then it went up with World War II. And then it went back down in the 50s. And then it went back up with the war in Vietnam. This, is, this has always been the case. This is not a new phenomenon. And I, I don't know what the right number is, by the way. I, I, I don't know whether it's 14 is too little, too much. I don't know whether it's 50%. I'm, I'm not sure that you can program news according to a quota. Yeah, but I think the point also is that, that Steve made is that um, it's the quality, not the quantity of what you're doing. And I think uh, on a given day, and, and Steve made the point very well, with 22 minutes, you've got to make a subjective decision on what is the most important news story to lead with and what are the most important uh, stories to do later in the broadcast. And, you know, if I look at some of the work that, um, that Richard Engel did this past week, La Lara Logan is embedded right now with um, some troops in Afghanistan or Martha Raddatz in Iraq or, or what Anderson's done this week. I think for anybody to say that the, um, the networks and the cable uh, networks are not committed to international news and are not doing a good job of covering news, I think is really um, is ludicrous, I think. And I, I go back to 2006 when the war broke out in the summertime when we were all planning on having nice summer vacations and all of a sudden in 26 hours we had uh, nine correspondents in the Middle East. I'm sure these guys had the same amount. Um, you know, the, the response when something is important to cover um, I think is remarkable and I think um, with a limited amount of time at the networks I think we do a pretty darn good job in doing that. And I think if, if, if in, in, the in the editorial decisions if we thought that um, more international news was needed um, on a certain day, you'll do, you'll do three or four stories on it. Let, let me pick up on that point, if I can, Sean. Let, let's assume that the dirty little secret is that the public really is <coughs> not as interested in international news as they are in, in, um, in right. domestic and other news, which, which I don't expect any of you to admit that, but it, it happens <laughs> to be the truth. <laughs> and, and, but, but having said that, mm -hmm. do you feel any obligation as news president to it sometimes say to your viewers, eat your spinach and watch this story. Yeah. Of course. Yeah, absolutely. Every, every day. We all do it every, every night. Every oh, single day. <coughs> and, and do you do it every day? What, what are examples of that? You know, uh, the, there ha I think all of us have done series. You know, last night the President of the United States asked for an hour of airtime in prime time, s setting full Congress meeting. Uh, to talk about the, the ABCs of healthcare and make his case. All of us have been doing a tremendous amount of reporting of what's really behind uh, all of this. What are, where are the, the priorities? What does this mean? What is this definition? What is the implication of a move like this? Uh, and I do think that there is an obligation that goes along with uh, running a news division to, f to make sure that we are putting context and real information out there on a daily, nightly basis. There's no question that that's part of our, our job. All of us run businesses, too, that exist in multiple dimensions, uh, online, <coughs> on mobile devices, and those audiences actually tell you more about the state of mind of the audience. And uh, for us, international news is the number four category. So it's, uh, it's right behind uh, crime and entertainment. 
And, uh, <laughs> but it's ahead of a lot of other categories that you, you know, would think might be much. So it actually tells you uh, that there's a big appetite out there. Uh, the more niche oriented you get. These guys have to exist in a more generalized environment, at least on television. For us in a news niche on cable, we can deliver more. I think we're expected to deliver more. And our audience, I think, probably regards it as, you know, not so much spinach as just part of a, a you know, the well-balanced diet that they're looking forward to every day. And you, you, you run the risk of under-delivering if you don't really offer a lot of it. You want to talk about spinach, or should I? Well, I, I, I mean, I don't think of it as spinach, but uh, I mean, I, I regard um, our job as reporting as much of the truth as we can find about things that matter to people. And some of those things are things that people just care about. And I don't think it's my job to judge that they shouldn't care about it. We have to report on it. But things that matter to people are also things that they don't know they should care about. And it has to be balanced the two. I mean, we all took the president's address last night. We didn't do that because we thought it would have the highest ratings. Uh, we make money off of it. The health care, I agree with the health care reform issue. I have no information at all that the American people is craving a lot more coverage about congressional back and forth on health care. Uh, Iraq, I think people have been off the Iraq story since about two or three months into the war, basically. And yet we've all committed amazing resources, not just in terms of people and money, but as Steve said, danger to our people over there uh, consistently throughout there. That, and that's because that's an important story. We have troops there. It's important to the country, and we cover it. So we all make these decisions every single day. Sean, let me, let me ask another question, start with you, if I could. Um, technology has, has, has made tremendous changes in the news business and news gathering business, particularly for, particularly for television. Um, one of the complaints that people raise about the networks is the reduced number of bureaus overseas. Mm -hmm. And yet those bureaus have been replaced by, in, in many cases, one person right. offices, as <coughs> call. Could you tell us why that works and why it's not a diminishment of international reporting? Well, I think it, um, it works because there is a different way to, to gather news now, which you just mentioned. Um, you know, we also have to take a step back and realize that whether we like it or not, we are part of corporations, and we do have some financial responsibility to our corporations. Having said that, um, many of the decisions, and David just mentioned the, the one about carrying the speech last night, many if not most of the decisions we, ba we make are not based on the financial realities. They're based on what we think a news division has to do. And the fact of the matter is um, with technology, with, with travel, and with the, with the cameras that the small reporters have, there are ways to cover the news with less people. Um, uh, you don't need a... Um, you know, a camera crew with you know, camera lighting, uh, an associate producer and a writer. And some of the kids that now are um, um, coming out of college who like to, be, like to be referred to as video journalists, I mean, really are qualified to go into a situation like the, the riots in Iran um, a few months ago and report some of the best stories and the best background that you can, you can ever see on television. <laughs> so I think the way that we're all trained now to cover news, especially, and it's not just the, I don't want to just generalize and say the, the young kids, because there are some correspondents we have who are older, who are um, passionate about um, trying to, to redo the way they cover the news. Um, I think it's just a, di a different format, and it's, it's necessity. I mean, it's um, in order to cover as many stories as we want to cover, you can't do it the way you used to with the infrastructure that used to be in place. You've got to do it more efficiently, um, and I think we're doing that. And I think, again, if you look at most of the stories that we've tried to cover in depth, I don't think the quality of the coverage is less than it was when Walter Cronkite was doing it in a, in a very different way. Um, and I'm a, I sound like a cheerleader for what we're all doing, but I think I just, I just would like examples of, um, of stories that we haven't done as good a job on as we should have. And I'm happy to debate that, but I, I'm pretty proud of the job that we've all done, um, those of us sitting up here. Steve? Can, can I, I think there's a couple things we've all faced the economic pressures and the realities of what's gone on in our industry. Where I think most of us have decided to invest is in actual coverage and things that are going to be either written about online, show up on our broadcast, show up on cable. Um, the infrastructures, as Sean mentions, have been reduced. There's no question about it that the, the NBC London Bureau is now housed within ITN headquarters in central London. It's not a standalone facility. I would much rather write a check 
to someone who is out covering stories for NBC News than to a landlord of a building uh, where we have you know, tremendous amount of square footage and uh, it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense these days when there are, is uh, a set amount of resources and you've got to be smart about what you're investing in and that's what we're trying to invest in now. Yes, it's smaller, the, the, the gear's smaller, the, the uh, ability to go to places uh, is actually enabled by decisions like that. Ann Curry has been able to go into Africa six times in the last, in recent years, simply because there's, there isn't an entourage that has to go in and do it. And I think as a result, we've been able to put the spotlight on parts of the world that have not been covered as extensively in the past. Look, look at the picture next to you, the, 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 all that newfangled technology that we're using to cover. You know, the, the business has always embraced the latest, greatest stuff to allow more people to penetrate more deeply in. Cinema Verite documentary making was enabled by the technological advance of making film cameras lighter. So suddenly you didn't have to just stand outside on a tripod. You could actually pick the thing up and get in there. So this is just taking that to them. David, last year ABC had 17 offices overseas. Um, uh, how do you count offices? You mean with including stringers and things? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm counting offices. No, well, we 17 countries. 17. No, we have a lot more than 17 if you count stringers. Those are the figures that you, your office has supplied. Well, it's a problem with my office. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. They're overseas working on stories. <laughs> <laughs> but but let, let me forget the number. Uh, can, can a one-person office, uh, can that person, if, if he or she calls the producer in New York, can get, they get stories on the air with the same clout and leverage that? Well, they can get stories on the air. Same clout and leverage. I mean, anyone who's worked in a news division would know there's a variety of clout and leverage. Let's be practical about that. How loud you know? scream? I mean, yeah, well, uh, you know, anchors have a tendency to have a little bit more clout and leverage than, uh, than correspondents. You know, and I have not uh, noticed that actually. <laughs> CBS is much more egalitarian. Yeah, than I, I, I haven't noticed that. I've not had that experience. But but the point is, the, the more important point is, we, we a couple of years ago uh, sent out these digital reporters, who, which we have in a variety of locations around the world, uh, who operate largely by themselves, often in a BBC facility or a AP facility, and, and we did it, frankly, to support our digital operations. Our, our online operations, our, our streaming uh, broadband operation, and to have somebody there in case something happened in, in the area, to get us on the air for the first 24 hours until we get a full team in. And that's worked beautifully. The thing that we did not, I did not anticipate, was the number of times when the people, because they were living there and really familiar with what was going on in the place, would call up and say, there is a very big story here that would make it on the air that otherwise never would have made it on the air, because we just weren't finding it. And frankly, to go back, to, to your, your question, Ken, uh, I think one of the things that, it, that happened within television news, I'll talk for us, not CNN so much because I'm not sure about the cable, but for the broadcast people, is as the money was coming in, the cost structure built up, and that included, let's be honest, the compensation paid to correspondents and producers. As those people got more and more expensive, it was more and more difficult to send them for a week or two weeks out to cover a story. Uh, often we'd be parachuting them in and they do the stand-up, but they were there for 24 hours. They, they were not reporting the way it used to happen, and that was, a, that was a cost issue, no question about it. Having somebody there that can live there in that environment and really know what's going on and call back in and say there's a story has allowed those people to get on the air much more than I ever anticipated. You know, another angle on the technology thing, when we watched what happened in Iran and, and people in Iran Twittering and, and Facebook, et cetera, um, and one of the, how do you, how do you, how does this, it, it obviously gives you lots more information, and particularly in a closed society. On the other hand, how do you verify it's accurate? So what are the kind of challenges you face, John? And it, it, it takes a lot of effort, uh, often a lot of money, a lot of manpower to verify all of this stuff that comes from uh, the fact that basically th we now have a bureau that is six billion strong. That's everybody in the world can contribute news to, to CNN or any of these guys. Um, but you do have to run it down. We created, in this specific case of Iran, the Iran desk. We have a number of Farsi speakers who work at CNN anyway. Not We didn't build it up in, in, you know, in anticipation of this. They just happen to work there, including our head of international news gathering. Um, and they worked literally around the clock, staffed, eight people per shift, uh, uh, comparing notes on what we were hearing over the transom, making phone calls, often under dangerous circumstances, checking with exile communities, 
who they were in touch with anyway. Uh, and often, you know, the temptation was there. You'd hear some dramatic piece of information. They're, they're killing somebody on the bridge, and quick, we have to get it. And you had to resist that until you could run it down and verify, and <clears throat> some of the stuff turned out to be true, and some did not. But it was a massive effort. Ken, we opened a bureau in Tehran a couple of years ago. We've got a full-time producer slash correspondent who happened to have been detained during the demonstrations, was beaten. Uh, is he still incarcerated? He, no, no, he, he, he is out and has just gone back in. He came out of Iran uh, for a while and he's gone back in, Ali Arouzi, who did some great work uh, during this time and I think uh, is an incredibly talented uh, reporter with a very bright future, operating in incredibly difficult circumstances in a very dangerous place. Um, but, but that's a bureau that was opened in recent years and we've, you know, we've opened in places like Pakistan and Afghanistan and other places now where there were bureaus where there were not before. Um, they're not enormous facilities. They may have a handful of people, but there's a presence there. And I think that that sort of investment is what, peop what we have and will continue to do. I think, I think if you look at um, our Paris Bureau, which used to be one of the better assignments of CBS <laughs> News, um, before my time, unfortunately. But I think in our, in our, in our height, the Paris Bureau probably had um, 16 or 17 people in it full time. And you ask yourself, if I had 16 or 17 very qualified journalists, would I have them sitting in Paris or would I maybe take three of them and put them in Tehran and three of them and put them in Pakistan? I think any in intelligent operator would say that's not a good way to run a business. And I think if, you know, I like to look at what some of the mistakes that, you know, the car companies have made. You know, I look at the, you know, the news business and what happened is that the automobile industry changed dramatically and the U.S. companies probably weren't fast enough in adjusting, but we're adjusting every day. And um, I think if the news business doesn't figure out and continue to figure out new ways to do business, we're going to be like the automobile industry, except the government will not bail us out. We'll go out of business. And we can't afford to do that. And I think I, I, I would like to spend 95% of my time worrying about editorial decisions and figuring out better ways of, um, um, of structuring our broadcasts. However, I spend a lot of my time trying to figure out taking the budget that we have and spending it in the most intelligent way. And as Steve said, putting the money that you have on the air and not in offices. And I think the more money you spend on people or technology or elements that directly get on television at 6.30, that's... Not, let, let me ask you, let me pick up on that. Sure. Point. So if, if Katie Kerr came to you tomorrow, mm -hmm. and I, the same question could be jump ball for right. all you other folks, and said, you know, I'm making roughly $15 million a year, and I want to give back $4 million of that I'm not getting to you, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> that was I a know you make class. less. <laughs> but I, but I, but I want to, I, I want to give back four million dollars of that, on condition that you apply it to news coverage. Would you make? Could you make that deal? <laughs> I would find it difficult to say no to that. McManus calls on I Furrit. Would it, of course, I would. I mean. I mean, if, if um, <laughs> you know, if, if, if a group of employees got together and said, cumulatively, we're making a million dollars a year, we think we aren't not doing a good enough job covering the news, we'll give you back 100,000. Of course I would say yes to it. But I don't think, I mean, that's not the issue we're dealing with. I think we're dealing with, um, um, as I said, the de declining audience, um, which is a, you know better than I do, is a, is a fact of life on all network television, not just, not just news. And we're in a we're in an environment where we're trying to spend the money most efficiently, and um, I don't expect to get any money back from people who are committed to get it. But you know, I do expect to spend a lot more time trying to figure out um, a better way to cover the news if we can. He should maybe put it into marketing her show instead. Yeah. <laughs> but no, no. But she made a condition. It has to go oh. into news gathering. Right. I haven't asked whether Les Moomez would agree to that. But but let me just move I on. I can to speak it. for Leslie and say yes. <laughs> <laughs> You know, you, you this can pick only up on be trouble. Yeah. Say that again. I said this can only lead to trouble. <laughs> now let's talk no, about. Don't let me let's stop you. It's okay. Yeah. <coughs> I had an anchor. Do it. Don't do it. Do you what? I had an anchor offer something close to that, and this anchor is no longer with us. Uh, it was not making fifteen million dollars, but not far off of it. Uh, actually, my recollection of the proposal was a matching plan, where for every uh, dollar. Uh, this person gave up. I'm trying not to reveal gender. Um, uh, the company would match it with a dollar. 
Uh, and I said no. Because? Because my job is figuring out what resources we need and allocating them correctly. And if I'm not doing that job, they should get a, a new Weston. Um, but if I believe that a million dollars or four million dollars into uh, news coverage would genuinely improve ABC News, then I <coughs> should be fighting for that anyway. I should get that anyway. Um, and, and if I don't, then I shouldn't be giving it up to an anchor to decide how we should be allocating our money. I, I just, I, I, so I, I said, thanks very much. I appreciate that. But, but you, it, what it does speak to, Ken, is within our, all of our organizations are people who feel passionate about journalism and about our industry and about where it's headed. And, and we've all had conversations with people who've said, listen, if, if, if I can do something that helps keep people employed, if I can do things that help keep uh, the quality of coverage high, sign me up. And, and people have those conversations. They, they're below the radar conversations, but they go on every day because people are passionate about what they do. Yeah, and, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Well, the, the truth about all journalists, I think, is that journalism is an obsession. It's not a profession. Most of the people in this business would do it for a hell of a lot less money. The money has sprung up around us. It's turned out to be a good business in, in many cases. but. I, most of the most of the people I can think of, some in this room and, and some elsewhere, would would do it for the love of it. And yes, they have to put food on the table, but they're not doing it in order to make fifteen million dollars a year. Uh, look John, at the people. Just one other point. Look at the people who go overseas into these war zones. Yeah. Of course, yeah. Yeah. every single one of them is a volunteer for those assignments. Yeah. You and and. You know, not for the money and not thinking it's going to land them their own show in prime time. And if they think that's why, if we think that's why they're doing it, chances are we're going to say don't go. Because that's the wrong reason to sign up for an assignment like that. You, you've all touched on the issue of uh, future and shrinking audiences and, and how you cope with that world. Um, when you look at what technology allows, I can get my information anytime I want on my schedule rather than on yours. And your audience isn't necessarily shrinking, as are newspapers and many magazines, et cetera. Uh, so what, what do you have to do? What, is the new, what are the new things you have to do to keep your networks relevant and maybe even increase your audience or, sh or shore it up? Well, unfortunately, I don't think there are any tricks. I think it all comes down to the content. And I think um, people are going to judge whether it's worth devoting a half an hour of their time to watching a evening news broadcast or 60 minutes or a 2020 or a dateline or all the, all the broadcasts we put on the air. I don't know if, if, if I knew of a secret, if we did, I think we would be employing it now. And it's not, it's not fancy on-air promotion because that can drive some viewers on a temporary basis and then they'll make their decision on a full, on, you know, permanently whether they're going to stay or not. But it's the quality of what you're putting on the air. I think. You know, we, we sit down and we look at our, the numbers for all of our broadcasts and say, what can we do to improve them? And you come up with, uh, you know, a nice promotional campaign or you come up with some marketing ideas or you change the pieces around. In the end, it's the quality of what you do. And I, I really believe that's, in the end, especially news viewers, the decisions that they make are based on what they think of the quality of your content. Look at this. Otherwise, why, why, would they, why would they be watching? I mean, it's, they're not watching it because, you know, someone is you know, better looking or not as good looking as someone else are watching because they, they think they're getting informed. And eventually they will go to the place where they believe they're getting the best information, I think. I mean, if, if not, then I don't think any of us should probably be in our jobs. 60 Minutes has had some of its most successful seasons ever in the last couple yeah. of years. With stories on credit default swaps, um, two yeah. of our highest rated International uh, broadcasts, stories. Credit default swaps. And I think that's a you know, really good example of um, if, you if you stick to your knitting and decide what your broadcast is going to be and you don't sacrifice the quality um, or your standards at all and you resist temptations, which Jeff Fager does every week. He probably has opportunities to put on a story that short term might spike his numbers and he just doesn't do it because over time all you have is your reputation and that's based on the quality of your content. The, you asked, the, you use the, the key word here, which is relevance. I, I mean, if, if we become irrelevant to the audience, then shame on us and, and uh, we'll never get that back. And so Sean's absolutely right. You can do some things that might get you a, a short burst or a short pop, but in the long run, we have to stay relevant to the audience. And that means uh, place your reporting in the places where it can be consumed by as many people as possible. If that means it's msnbc.com online, great. If that means if it's on MSNBC on cable, fine. If that's on today, nightly, meet the press, dateline, 
Great. Uh, what what if know, our best scenario is having it on all of those places? But what if it means that that appointment television, six thirty at night, when many people are not even home from work yet, including women, who were who were more devoted watchers twenty years ago. What if it means that that kind of appointment television is a relic, and therefore the notion of an evening newscast is a relic? Can you imagine that happening one day? Someone wrote a book predicting that, I think. Really? <laughs> yeah, I, I, he, I, I'm getting old, I forget. Yeah. I, I came to Capital Cities ABC in uh, February of 1991 when the Gulf War was on. And I remember the first day I was in the office, we were talking about the death of the evening news. Now that was over 18 years ago. And that, uh, it's, it's, it's alive and kicking and getting, reaching millions and millions of people. So my experience, at least, is that people have over-predicted the death of the evening news for a long time now. Now, you had an elision in what you said, which is if appointment television is uh, no longer the case or a relic, then doesn't that mean that evening news will die? Those two things are not necessarily tied up together. I mean, no, th no. there can be reporting on the evening news that's brought together that's made available on dot-com and then streaming video and broadband and things that people do want and need and value that will keep the evening news alive for a very long time to come even if they don't have the time to tune at 6.30 at night. So the two are not necessarily tied. No, no, but, but I'm actually asking, uh, I actually, uh, I could, could you imagine a, a time where you no longer have that 6.30 slot? You've given it back to someone else, but you still have 20, you're producing news on all these different platforms. I can imagine anything. I can imagine playing in the U.S. Open, but <laughs> I don't think it's probably going to No, I've watched you soon. play tennis. Exactly. Well, <laughs> I, I can, that, that's my point. I can still imagine it. And you have seen me the play other, tennis. The so. other thing I think, Ken, you have to remember is that um, we don't do newscasts at 6.30 to make a lot of money for the network. And fortunately, the people who are now running the companies that decide what we do believe that there is part of, part of the obligation of having a network is supplying a full-service news organization. And I think... Um, I know my boss um, uh, wouldn't, doesn't believe that the CBS television network would be what it is without a strong and vibrant CBS news. And, and it, he, could, he could cancel the evening news tomorrow and make probably a lot more money for our corporation. And I guess you could say, well, that's good for the stockholders and the, and the, uh, and the investors. He doesn't make a decision based on that. And uh, it's, it's hard for me to imagine that there is um, going to be someone who's going to run one of our parent companies who's going to say, you know something? CBS News is not important. We don't need to do that because it's part of an obligation. It's part of what, you know, with all due respect to, you know, USA Network and Lifetime, it's one of the things that makes a network different and important, and I think that's going to continue for a long time. And you talk about the, the ratings. Listen, the, the ratings have been going down steadily for a long time, but there are still about 25 million people a night that watch one of our three broadcasts, and despite all the great work that Jonathan does, and you do some of the best work on television, I mean, the, 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 the cable audience compared to what we generate at 6.30 is minuscule. And I think that's something to remember. I mean, there are a lot of people, and yes, they're older, um, and yes, they are uh, declining in terms of numbers, but an awful lot of people rely on us um, as a very important, if not the primary source of news. And I think that's an obligation of the network, and I think it's an obligation of the news division also. The, the interesting thing is that they, the, the broadcast networks attract and aggregate that 20 million some odd number. We attract on the big events more viewers now than we've ever generated, it's such that on some of those big nights, we're beating the broadcast networks and coverage like election night and the primary coverage and things like that. It's an interesting uh, phenomenon that takes place, and it may have something to do with, in this very fragmented media environment, being able as a cable network to be in touch <coughs> with viewers all the time. The right, just just constantly letting them be aware. Hey, if there's a speech, if there's a primary, if there's a Michael Jackson funeral coverage, Ted Kennedy funeral, you know, you're just able to be in touch m more often. But I think the public may place too much emphasis on the evening newscast as a barometer of the health or importance or vitality of the broadcast network news organizations. They each have programs. I mean, look at Nightline came out of nowhere to revive itself with, with you know, programming that is watchable and fun and interesting every single night. And nobody thought that that would happen. The Today Show sets the agenda every morning in those first 20, 25 minutes. So they, they have a lot of tricks up their sleeve beyond the evening newscast. And that leads to a point that I think at least is important because uh, listening to us, it sounds like we're a bit defensive of the status quo. Really? <laughs> um, you wouldn't have Sorry, noticed that, Ken. Sorry, I couldn't that. 
I think everything that's been said is absolutely true, but I think there is another point. I think there is one fundamental change that we are only beginning to come to terms with, and we have not. I'll speak for ABC News. I won't speak for my colleagues. I've not come to terms with. We need to provide people with uh, information that's valuable to them and that's relevant to them. We also, in this new world, have to provide them with information they're not getting anywhere else. It has to be distinctive. That didn't used to be the case. When they were in the good old days, when we weren't there, when there were three broadcast networks, you know, you could basically do the same news everybody else is doing and they'd tune in because they really trusted Walter Cronkite or they loved Huntley Brinkley or whatever. Those days, I think, are gone and I'm not sure we've caught up with that yet. And, and actually, it goes back to some of the international coverage we were talking <coughs> about earlier because often some of the most distinctive, unusual, different coverage that you can do happens to come from overseas stories. At least that's <coughs> been our experience. Now, it could also be a Brian Ross investigation or something like that. But those sort of really exclusive reports where you own it on enterprise journalism, I think become much, much more valuable because it gives people a reason to tune in. Because if it's just information that's accurate and reliable and relevant and valuable, they can get that from a lot of different sources now. But every time we've, we've taken these steps, the first <coughs> thing that happens is this chorus of, well, look what they're doing. They didn't cover such and such today. Yeah. You're going to make. You're going to have to make some tough decisions when you go down that path, and I would argue that we've been doing that for quite some time, especially in the evening. But the, every time that you know we, we do that, then it's oh, you're too featurey, or you're too soft, or, or how dare you to say to provide context as opposed to reporting on what happened today. We, we get we take it on the chin on those days. We're that's fine. Everybody can and should have a view on what we're doing. But I think these evening newscasts are are incredibly important to the overall. Um, health of not just the news divisions, but also the networks. I mean, the image, one of the, the best images, frankly, of NBC is going to come from the news division. The strength of, of Brian's broadcast, the strength of today, meet the press, and so forth. I mean, I think that I don't see, to your question about do, do we envision it going away, I don't see it going away. But, but pick up on, on trust and Brian and, and, and the theme you were just playing on. One rarely encounters someone in public life who doesn't complain about not just you guys, right. but everyone in the press being preoccupied by conflict. <coughs> and if you listen to President Obama's speech yesterday at the Cronkite Memorial Service, he was talking as well about the weaknesses of the press and, and how the speed to get things published sometimes contradicts the need to get it right, which he said Cronkite stood for. So what do you say to a person in public life who says, you guys, you're bi I'm not worried about your liberal bias. I'm worried about your bias to conflict. And there's too much of that in the press. Bias to what? Of conflict. conflict. They're probably talking about a lot of uh, outlets that we don't have anything to do with. You know, blogs really uh, can range from the super uh, relevant and important uh, to just pure noise and gossip. And there's so much of that. There's so much tabloid uh, press out there, print press out there. And the direction that web news, quote unquote, is going is so gossip oriented no, but that it adds to that. I, there, John, the, the, the compressed are probably less about the, the NBC nightly news. Doing no, that. but, but I mean, to be specific, Robert Gibbs, the press secretary to the President of the United States, has said in his briefings regularly, I'm tired of watching these food fights on cable. Well, a lot of the, the, we, we bend over backwards to avoid that and to focus on substance. There's a lot of it on cable, but of course, that's their beef. I mean, they're they're an interested party. They're not above the fray, you know. Like, you know, so is that court. part of the answer, though, to the to the politician or public official who complains that that's your beef? You have a vested interest. Well, they do have a vested interest, and they are not nonpartisan in it, and they tend to complain when they don't have people agreeing with them. They don't complain, you know, they don't complain about Keith Olbermann being over the top and opinionated when Keith Olbermann agrees with them or Rachel Maddow. They do complain when O'Reilly or, or Glenn Beck, you know, uh, weigh in against them. And it was the opposite during the previous administration. And I'm not sure there's, there's uh, necessarily that much more dissatisfaction. It's just that there are so many more um, venues to express that dissatisfaction, um, whether it's talk radio or the blogs um, or cable television. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure if you, if you went back 20 years and actually asked as, as many people who are blogging or are making comments on 
um, you know, community websites what they thought, whether they would be any less critical. It's just now that there's a much better vehicle to express your outrage. And, um, and I think that did, obviously didn't exist 10 years ago, much less 20 years ago. So there's, there's a lot more noise around television news that we're under a lot more scrutiny. The politicians are much more vocal about what's being done, primarily because um, in the last three or four years, obviously, cable news is unbelievably opinionated. And, um, and, 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 that, and get, that gets politicians' attention, obviously. And they talk about it, and it feeds upon itself. And, um, but I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that, um, that people are more or less dissatisfied now. It's just that the- Why then does survey research suggest that no one approaches in the press uh, the numbers that Walter Cronkite once had for being trusted? Fragmentation. That yeah, would be true I, of pretty much any institution but, in the United States of America. Yeah. Well, to but phrase we, but we have we, we have a daily opinion poll, which is the in the form of the ratings. I mean, people, again, if we're not relevant, if we're not trusted, if we're not respected, people are going to tune out. I mean, it, it, it is in our best interest to make sure that these news divisions are as appealing and as respected as possible and doing doing work that, that stays relevant for the audience. Because if, if not, we're, we're doomed to extinction given the fragmented world in which we're, we're operating. But, but Ken, in my experience, one of the really difficult parts of being a journalist, you must feel this way, is if you're doing your job, you will always be criticized. And on the one hand, you can't simply disregard the criticism because often there's a point to it that you have to internalize. At the same time, you can't be so defensive about it that you change what you're doing. You change your reporting, you back off. Uh, and trying to do those two things that are inconsistent are very difficult to do. In, in my view, when you talk about covering conflict, the thing that resonates with me and that I am concerned about, and I've, I've spoken internally and externally about this within the network context, is some of the cable back and forth that we see, which is fine. It's what they do. They do it well. They're successful with it. I'm not criticizing that. <coughs> can infiltrate what we do, and it can turn into reporting, which is on the one hand, on the other hand. And you can find people to express just about any point of view in the society at this point. Part of our job is when there are things that we can know, rather than simply uh, our, as a jump ball, who knows what's going on, uh, we have a responsibility to step up and say, this is what we know. That can be true with medical studies. It can be true with what's going on with the healthcare uh, debate. I mean, some of the things you can prove, is it right or is it wrong? We have an obligation to step to the floor. It can be true with polls. Polls get reported, like, oh, there's a poll that says this, a poll that says Some polls are very valuable and accurate. Some are not worth the paper they're written on. And I do become concerned that sometimes, as we watch our brothers and sisters in cable, that we can fall into a pattern, even on the evening news, of doing pieces, which are easy to do. Get a person on this side and a person on this side, you put them both up, okay, I've done my job, you decide to the audience, which is not a service. So I think there is a point I would take in that criticism that we need to really guard against that. I'm also going to speak up here for cable news a little bit in that you know, I, I run both NBC Network News and, and MSNBC. Um, and clearly as the cable news environment has become more politicized, there was concern within NBC News, is that going to portray, or is NBC News going to be painted with the same brush? And we've had these conversations extensively as you can well imagine. But I, I think that cable news, you know, CNN learned it with Crossfire when everybody kind of got into it that we, we certainly learned it through years and years of experimentation with the one side and the other side and the hot argument. And, you know, there was an awful lot of time spent doing that sort of programming. And in the end, the audience said they wanted something else. Because I think what we've found is that the, the old food fight that used to be the thing that drew a lot of attention on cable news has kind of... That, that time's passed of cable news. I think there's a lot more of substance going on there. I think, to your point, David, about trying to hold people's feet to the fire and do some real reporting and state what's fact and what's, what's fiction uh, is what, at its best, cable news is doing these days. Uh, and, I, and I think, you know, I, we, we look at, from NBC, and to answer the question about does the audience understand the difference between the two and the mandates of the two divisions of NBC News? And I think the answer is yes. I mean, you can't have the success that we've had on the broadcast side if, if you think that you're going to be painted with the same brush as MSNBC. Yeah, and what Steve says is a critical point. I mean, there is a place for opinion in journalism. Uh, uh, newspapers have always had an editorial page. They have had op-ed pages. 
it's perfectly legitimate, but you know when you're on the editorial page, you're getting opinion. You know when you're out in the op-ed section what you're getting. What, when it gets dangerous is where the two start to spill over into one another, and the audience isn't sure. Well, that's the argument that, that happens arguably uh -huh. on but, but you know what? Dobbs on his I think network. We have to be yeah. very not, not anymore. Uh, actually, Lou, Lou doesn't offer his opinions on a show anymore. He doesn't do it. We stepped in and we made him understand this very thing that you, he, he's got a radio talk show where he does all sorts of things. That's radio. We don't oversee his radio talk show. But the interesting and op, the optimistic <laughs> uh, piece of news here is that um, as our cable competitors have become more uh, overtly. Uh, partisan on the left or the right, and we have really tried to focus on being a deliverer of news and analysis that is down the middle, w e even as they rise, and they are rising in the ratings, both Fox and MSNBC, our <clears throat> prime time, our numbers are higher than they've been in six years. So there is an audience for what we do. There is an audience for what they do. There's all kinds of audiences these days. That's why my answer to your question was fragmentation. There's, there's no one person you can trust. People trust the person whose point of view they believe. So some people adore Glenn Beck and trust everything he says. Think of your favorite columnists in the Wall Street Journal, the Financial Times. Or the, you trust the ones you believe. You read their column and you say, that guy gets it. How come they don't all get it that way? And that's what everybody does. That's, where, you know, that's the root of trust. But yeah. that's, that's a fundamental change from the days of Walter Cronkite. There weren't in as the many days options. Where, pardon? There weren't as many options. There were no, no, people but, but you could choose to trust. I understood. But, but the, it begs the question, my last question before we go out to the audience, which is, uh, do we pay a price as citizens in America? The fact that, you don't, that people seek the news from, from their favorite sites, be it Beck or Overman or, or ABC, who, wherever it is, and because they don't trust <laughs> the universal... Beck, Overman, ABC. No, no, I, I didn't mean that. <laughs> so, uh, I just meant various news. That, that's it. So, but is there a point where, where, where no one, there's no commonly accepted set of facts that people accept? Walter Cronkite talks about Vietnam. That's commonly accepted fact. The New York Times, commonly accepted. And we, we've moved to an era where that's, there is not a commonly accepted set of facts. I, I think um, there's a little bit of a disconnect here in that we're talking about the, the overall news business, and we're talking about cable and Oberman and Beck and ABC News and CBS News. I don't think, and maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think what we're doing and what my counterparts are doing at, at ABC and NBC at, at 6.30 is all that much different than what Walter was trying to do. You can argue whether we're doing a better or a worse job, but our charge is still the same. And I'm talking about the audience, not you. Right. I'm, I'm not suggesting you're doing something different. But, but I'm saying they perceive because of variety and the polarization of society, the audience perceives information differently than they did 10 or 15, but, but, 15 20 years ago. Ken, I, I would have three responses. One is, that's what's happened. Get over it. I mean, that, that's, just, that's just true. That's right. And more important than that, it's a terrible mistake for any of us to try to put ourselves um, between what technology makes possible and what our audience wants. <coughs> and our audience wants that. I mean, and it's their right to want it. Who are we to say no? Number two, why don't we trust the American people ultimately to, to, to really come to the right conclusions? And we always have to be a history of this country. I mean, if you go back to the broadsheets and, you know, the late 18th century, there were some pretty remarkable newspapers out there saying some pretty scurrilous things about Thomas Jefferson and John Adams. But somehow we trusted the American people to figure out what's, what's really going on and come to sensible decisions over time on average, not that we haven't made some dis mistakes. But three... We can't let the best be the enemy of the good. The fact that we will not reestablish Walter Cronkite because of technology and this does not mean we can't have people who are trusted. Brian Williams is sitting here, Charlie Gibson, Katie Couric, who are not Glenn Beck or, or Overman. I mean, I, I don't, we shouldn't just give up the game and say we won't get to Walter Cronkite, so let's throw in the towel. It's impossible. I don't think that's true. I think that we can have relatively more trusted people and that there's a great value in that. On that eloquent note, let's turn to the audience, which has some questions. Uh, Steve, would you stand up and identify yourself? Wait for the microphone. Yes. Hi. Thanks, Ken. Uh, I'm Steve Shepard, uh, City University Graduate School of Journalism. Uh, there are many reasons for the decline in uh, audience of the nightly news shows, uh, but surely one of them is the, the secular change towards digital delivery and people spending time on the internet to get their news. 
Um, what are you doing about that? How will you address this increasingly large audience, a younger audience who gets their news in other ways than watching your shows? <coughs> How will you reach them? And what is a business model that might work to reach them? We have MSNBC.com is our online home, and it's a an enormously successful not just journalistic enterprise, I would argue, but also business. And uh, you know, every week I'll get uh, we get tons of research. Every week, one of the things that I get that's most interesting is the total audience measurement index, the TAMI as they call it, which not only looks at the traditional ratings but also includes. You know, Meet the Press is seen on broadcast. It's seen a couple times on MSNBC on cable. And there's a big section on MSNBC.com with the, the program in its entirety. Segments, things that are done exclusively for the MSNBC.com audience. Brian you know, begins his day every day by writing his uh, daily nightly blog and is on that thing throughout the day. Um, I think it's about... I'll say it again, it's about being relevant to your audience and make, if, if people are, are consuming their news via the internet, then you need to be in that space and you need to be there with, again, unique content and a trusted source and be a trusted source for that information. So, I mean, that's where we've placed our, our, our biggest bets uh, in terms of trying to attract a, young, attract a younger audience and stay relevant in their lives. Next question, yes. Yes, I'm Rahi Badargam of Al Hayat, and uh, I just want to your point, Sean, that which stories have not been covered by you. I'd like to mention just a couple. For example, what's going on in Yemen now? Mm -hmm. It's a fundamental big crisis that even affects the United States in the final analysis mm -hmm. because it is about the rebirth of Al Qaeda. Lebanon is another example. Mm -hmm. These are big stories that have been missed by, I believe, all networks or have been visited occasionally. So there, uh, uh, not that you need my support as a great moderator, but to, 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 to the point that uh, has been made quite often, I feel that uh, somehow you have not done international news unless there are American mm -hmm. news. I and that's a problem. That's what, and the, so the question is, could we do the example of Fadi Zakaria, for example, anywhere to replace some of the egocentric shows that are focused about one person? Or can this sort of thing make its way to a network, ABC, CBS, mm -hmm. uh, NBC proper? Thank you. Well, I, I can argue, and I'm sure there are other good examples, I can argue with you that there are stories out there that we aren't covering. We have, um, unlike Jonathan, um, to a large extent, we have a lot of limitations in what we can cover. And um, we try to do a lot of those stories on 60 Minutes. The, the mix of stories on 60 Minutes is much more international now than it used to be. But to be honest with you, with a 22-minute broadcast every night, there are always going to be stories that we sh probably should be covering and don't have time to cover. Um, and I, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a, um, a finite universe that we're existing in. Um, having said that, um, you know, I'm sure that there are stories that should be on um, the evening news that we're not covering, and we maybe need to do a better job of doing that. Um, but it's a, it's a really, really good point. Um, and sometimes we tend to, um, more often than we should, perhaps follow the news instead of get ahead of the news. And there was obviously criticism, which we won't go into now, about um, you know the war in Iraq and, and, and how much was done before that. And I think we all learned a lot of lessons now. And I think one of the things that we've talked about a lot editorially is trying not to make some of those same mistakes with what's going on in Afghanistan. I think if you're looking at the reporting that's being done by all the news organizations on Afghanistan, I think the approach is very, very different. And I think the questions that we're asking both there and in the States are much more pointed and I think we're much more analytical in terms of what's happening in Afghanistan right now and what is going to happen there in the future. But I, but I take your point and it's a good one. Yes. Hi, thank you, Rory O'Connor from Media Channel. Uh, Sean, I think you <laughs> Chuck, I thought yep. you made a great point when you compared uh, the network news divisions to uh, General Motors. But uh, from my perspective, instead of uh, you know, embracing a change, as you seem to be saying, you all seem to be still manufacturing Hummers. Uh, now, a case in point is the comments on the anchors. You know, $15 million for a newsreader seems like a lot to me in a day when bureaus are being shut down. So I guess my question is really to David, because you just had an opportunity to address this uh, by replacing Charlie Gibson. 
And yet, you went with Diane Sawyer. I don't know how much she makes, but it's probably in excess of uh, seven million, ten million. You tell us. Also, I must just for well, I'm eager to do that. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> I've, been, I've been hoping someone would ask that question. <laughs> Okay, I'd like to hear that. And also, just for the record, uh, I wonder if you could amplify on what I found your shocking admission that you had refused a dollar-for-dollar dollar offer from a previous anchor to improve news coverage. Uh, well, let me go back to that. Um, I, I tried to make this clear, but maybe I should be even more forceful in it. Uh, as long as I have this job, it's my job to figure out how we allocate our resources. And if I'm going to give that up to the anchors, so that we all get together, so they get to decide where we open bureaus and where we don't open bureaus, and when we send people out on, on reporting missions and when we don't, then I shouldn't have my job. That's just not the way, in my opinion. We, it's, not, it's not a collective. We don't take a plebiscite you know, to decide when we cover the hurricane or whether we cover a story in the Sudan or something. And that's just the way I perceive my job. And I think that that's what that inevitably would have meant. And, and I also should say, I have little doubt that if I went to my bosses and said, we need four more million dollars, and it's really going to make a big difference uh, in news coverage, that I could get that. The problem I have is a different problem. We're spending that four million dollars in places where it doesn't affect news coverage, and it doesn't help us. And until I've taken care of those issues, and it goes back to some of the infrastructure in the bureaus and things. I mean, uh, Garrick's here, and so maybe he can tell me whether it's actually true or not, but I'm told that there was a wine cellar and a chef in the Paris Bureau at one point for ABC News. Uh, now, I don't know what that did to help our coverage in Paris. Maybe Garrett could tell oh, us Oh, I that. could yeah. think of something. <laughs> it was Pierre Salinger. That's exactly right. So, so my responsibility is to allocate those resources, and I'm not done allocating the resources properly. Now, and let me just take issue with one of the things you said. For a news reader, uh, I think that betrays a fundamental misunderstanding of the role of an anchor. Uh, people tend to see only the part of the iceberg that's above the surface that you see on the air, and you say, well, they get on and they read the news. Uh, a really successful, uh, good news anchor uh, represents the entire institution in who they are. Charlie Gibson's a good example. Charlie Gibson was a beat reporter for years in Washington. He paid his dues. He has covered every major story. It's not because he can just, quote, read the news. It's because of what he brings to the organization, brings to the reporting, brings to the editorial judgment uh, of what goes on the evening news and how it's done. So it's, it's, it's a, it's a misnomer. If we were a news reader, you're absolutely right. We just get the prettiest one and you know, the one that reads the prompter the best. Uh, that's not the way it works. I, mean, I can understand where someone who doesn't understand it from the outside would see it that way. <clears throat> it's actually not the way it works at all. Uh, and, and, and to the last one, uh, it's not just uh, Diane. I've had uh, the burden of uh, several decisions about, about the evening news anchor. It's more than one. I've had several of those, unfortunately, not through choices of my own. Garrick? Uh, wait, wait, wait for the microphone. Yeah. Garrick, I'll be the Levitt Institute, State University of New York. Uh, Jonathan, CNN, because you're in a slightly different category. You're CNN USA, but CNN obvi obviously has CNN International, a vast organization, news gathering, covering the news, and we, that hasn't come into the conversation. I recall that when the Iraq evasion occurred, I believe CNN had all its people in place, all that editorial material coming in, but there were two anchor studios, one for CNN USA, with the American flag, and <laughs> separate anchors across the hall for CNN International, more or less without the American flag, which is a very, I think it's the first time in history that an organization, for understandable reasons, had the same editorial content but a certain tone or delivery system because of that. But that aside, that it shows the importance of CNN International. My question for this country and our viewers here is to what extent do you see a possibility and would it be desirable in CNN's eyes to have CNN International as a separate channel on cable. It exists, I know, in certain tiers if you pay for it. But really, as a real presence, uh, would the cable uh, carriers want that? Uh, would CNN want that as competition to CNN USA? Because that would be the real test of what Americans want to watch in terms of international news. So tell us about the strategy. The cable operators really are the ones who decide which of our suite of networks, including HLN, uh, Turner Sports, TNT, TBS, which ones they want to carry. And they choose to carry CNN, US, the network we all know and love is CNN here. Um, it is available on certain systems. Certain systems have chosen to make it available to their viewers. Um, but that's their decision. We don't put, you know, shove it down their throats or anything like that. We have, as you know, in these negotiations, the programmers have limited uh, leverage, and so that's that's how that comes about. Uh, let's get 
the woman in the back there with her hand up? Yes. Um, yeah, Eva Schweitzer, I'm a journalist. Um, James Murdoch uh, said recently he's not satisfied with the way the BBC is a competition because uh, the BBC is getting, in effect, tax money from the British taxpayer. That he considers that an unfair advantage. So what is your take on that? Are you seeing the BBC as an unfair competition? Because it's on American TV as well. There's BBC America, and I think they do have a following. Well, they have a following, but they've had a tough time getting traction. To Garrick's question about would the audience go with it, they've had, they have had a tough time with a, an incredibly strong offering it, in, from a pr programming and production and journalistic point of view, but it is, it is having a tough time getting an audience and traction in the United States. I don't, you know, I don't draw any conclusions from that. I just point that out. Um, uh, do I think that we're disadvantaged by that? No, I think that uh, uh, good for the BBC, and, and, and that's wonderful. Um, I would note that uh, Mr. Murdoch's network didn't carry the president's speech last night, uh, which I think is an interesting editorial call. Uh, but um, there you go. I'll leave it at that. So, yes. Yes, sir. Just wait for the microphone, please. In the front row here? No, in the front row. Demo. Thank you. Uh, I'm Eugene Staples. Uh, what happens if we continue to see the collapse of newspapers? Let's say 10 years from now, maybe 10% of what's left now, which is sort of a ridiculously small number, but remain out of what used to be a great written media. Uh, how much of that load are you going to be able to pick up? Or how much do you want to pick up? Well, who's going to pick it up? Anybody? Nobody? Well, the well, loss of newspapers would be a tragic loss for the country. I, I agree with you. It's something that we have to seriously contemplate as a possibility. But it would be a great loss. I mean, I, I've said to um, one of the senior people at Google, um, when I do Google searches, a lot of what I get uh, as a practical matter comes from newspaper reporters across the country. And if you, with a magic wand, wiped out <coughs> all of those local reporters, it's going to even hurt what we get on the Internet. Uh, in terms of information. So I, I hope that it doesn't happen. It won't be good for the country and it won't be good for journalism in general. Now, if it were to happen, uh, I think we would all have to take a hard look at whether it makes sense for us to move in and try to cover some of the local things in more detail than, than we have been. Now, that's for the local <coughs> stations. It would be, I don't think the networks would go in as a network, but, but through our own stations and affiliates. And there, there'll be some people who will want to step in and fill that void as there always have been in the history of newspapers. Often it's a, a philanthropical undertaking that, that is not meant to generate the kind of profits a, a billionaire could generate investing in other businesses. So you see David Geffen panting to take a stake or take over the New York Times. There'll be those sort of socially minded folks probably who would step in for key newspapers, I would guess. Questions? There's somebody in the room. Yes, the gentleman there, please. Yeah, I'm Crocker Snow, the director of the Edward R. Morrow Center at the Fletcher School. And I find it notable, you've all noted the diminishing audience for the network news, obviously, and you've all implied that a lot of younger viewers are not with you that were 15, 20 years ago. I find it really notable that nobody here has mentioned John Stewart and the role, not only Stewart as an individual, but that way to get across important news issues and points of view. Well, I think there's a great place for John Stewart. I think he, he, a lot of people enjoy watching him. I think he's in a very different business than we're in right now. Um, and I don't think, um, at least in the foreseeable future, what he is doing um, is something that applies to what, what we're doing. I think um, you know, a lot of young people, and you can debate this, a lot of young people think that they are getting <coughs> their news from um, John Stewart. And I would just question how you define news at that point. Uh, I, I watch the show four nights a week if I can. Um, I love the show. But I think it's a, it, it's a little bit like comparing, I think, and I don't mean this in a derogatory sense at all, because I think he's one of the most creative, um, entertaining, um, gentleman on television, but I think uh, to try to mix up what he's doing with what we're doing, I think it's kind of like comparing what you know, we're doing on the CBS Evening News to something else on, on the CBS Television Network, like an entertainment show. Um, and I'm not saying he's not providing a lot of good information, giving his perspective and his insight, 
but I think it's a very different form and a very different um, uh, program than what we're trying to produce. And he's the first to admit that. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. We have time for one last question. Yes, sir. I'm Maury Hellitzer. I was a 1960 61 fellow. Uh, the attention span of young people seems to be contracting. How does the network plan on addressing that since the attention span is contracting? Quick, 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 get, get, me, get me the news. Never mind the depth, never mind the breadth. That, that's been happening for some years. I mean, it's funny, if you go back and look at a world news from 20 years ago, it seems so slow now. I mean, it just it takes forever, and there's so much. And it, it's, uh, so that's, that's a pattern that's been happening. But the real answer is the way to reach um, younger people uh, is through uh, going to them in the ways they're coming to the news. It's, it's the internet. It's cell phones. It's things like that and giving them uh, material that they can access and just see the part of they want and get in and out. And, and if you do that, uh, our experience at least, is you can be pretty successful with that. Last word, Steve? I think, you know, we, we uh, all attended Walter Cronkite's memorial yesterday. And uh, it, was a, it was a beautiful, uh, fitting tribute to, to a great man and journalist. I do think, though, it is very tempting to look in the rearview mirror and always proclaim what has gone before us as the golden era of whatever profession you're looking at. I do think that there is some great work being done these days. And it deserves to be celebrated as much as it deserves to be picked apart. And I'm not asking for a free pass. I think we're all open to scrutiny and welcome it. But uh, beware of scrutiny from people who are politicos. Uh, and let's get behind the people who have devoted themselves to this craft and recognize that there is still great work being done and it, 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 the work that we do does play an important role. It should not be the only source of news for people, but it is an incredibly important time. And the other thing I would just say is I don't apologize for, as a news person and somebody who grew up at NBC News, I don't apologize for running my organization as a business. Because if I don't do that, someone who comes in without a journalism background is going to step in and say, you had your chance, you can't do it. And so it behooves us to get it right. I did have a question I was going to ask, which is what happened to the wine cellar in Paris? <laughs> <laughs> and, but I, I, I'll, you don't have to answer that. I just want to thank you gentlemen for, and thank the audience. Thank you, Ken. Well done. Good job. Good. 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 Thank you, man. Thank you for watching this Council on Foreign Relations video. For additional audio, video, and transcripts of CFR meetings, as well as expert analysis of international news, please visit us online at CFR.org.